parallels on the Mac to run Windows, then you don't have to worry about any of those problems because you're still running Mac OS. You just happen to be running Windows inside of a little window. All the drivers are handled by Mac OS. Now that we've covered that, okay, let's talk about the hardware. Obviously a little color difference here, whatever you think is more styling. We have this kind of indigo blue black for the Samsung. That's something they've been doing for a while with their Series 9 and now a T-Book 9 high-end Ultrabooks. And with the Mac we get the same usual very attractive silver casing. Aluminum casing on it. Big track pads on both of these. Now Samsung does one of the better jobs among Windows vendors, which you might think is not saying much with track pad drivers, but actually very pleasant to use. Very nice surface, feels good, multi-touch works on this. It's responsive, it's not too flaky. So uh, among Windows Ultrabooks, I would say that you're looking at the closest competitor to the Mac in terms of trackpad behavior. Now the Mac under OS 10, boy, perfect trackpad behavior. It's always been the model of how a trackpad should behave. Single touch, multi-touch gestures, all of that. Both of these have good keyboards. I give the point to the Mac though. I, because it has more key travel. It just feels more comfortable to type on. The previous Samsung Series 9 that didn't have the touch screen had a little bit more key travel, but because the display is a little bit thicker on this, they thinned out the bottom here to keep the same incredibly thin design. So it's not a bad keyboard, but key travel is quite shallow, so a little bit less comfortable. Backlighting on these is excellent, both of them, and you can adjust the level of backlighting on each of them. With the Samsung, you can get a kind of blue-white backlighting that's really subtle and very nice. You know, it's not glaring out. You don't have light shooting at you from around the edges of the keys and glaring. It's the nicest looking backlight I've ever seen. Of course, with the Mac, it's also very good. And I don't think anybody's ever complained about Mac OS keyboard backlighting. It's nice stuff. In terms of weight, your Samsung weighs 3.06 pounds. The Mac is 3.46 pounds, so about a half a pound of difference. And for those of you who are used to ultra portables or really just carry around a lot of stuff or travel all the time, you will feel a half a pound of weight difference. I know I do. So something to keep in mind there. But what you get with the Mac is a whole lot more power inside with that half a pound, which is something nice to say. And also, Apple manages to keep it thin. Because it has that straight-sided design, it doesn't look that thin. It's 0.71 inches. But as you can see, nose to nose, because they tapered the Samsung and they do the same trick Apple does with the MacBook Air, they taper it up on the side, so you just think the side is a thin lip. Well, no, there's a curve to the bottom, so it's actually, you know, a little bit thicker than it looks. Anyway, you can see that they're both actually quite thin. The Samsung's slightly thinner at the back. It's a small difference, honestly. It just looks more tapered. And if we take a look around, you can see what I mean. This this whole silver accent really defines the edges and makes you think, wow, that is a super slim machine. Now it's gorgeous looking and it has that kind of cut off pure metal looking design here combined with the dark flowing curves. It's very attractive. The back is pretty easy to remove or the bottom cover right here, but RAM is soldered on board. You do have access to the SSD drive inside and the wireless card. That's about it for things that you can actually upgrade on, but it is easier to open up. Mac, on the other hand, always the Paragon and Pleasant design. Nothing really has changed here for a couple of years with the MacBook Pro line. Pretty hard to upgrade stuff inside of here. Apple really doesn't intend you to. You could, in theory, upgrade your SSD drive. RAM is soldered on on this guy, too. Still a good-looking machine, even if they haven't changed it much. Sturdy. Now, some people claim that this guy picks up scratches, and I've owned quite a few MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs, and I haven't yet to really scratch one up when I take it traveling, but there it is. Some people claim that you actually can. And I'm sure if you attack this with keys, like some of those psycho durability tests you'll see on YouTube, well, probably then it would get scratched. Now in terms of ports, right here we have two Thunderbolt 2 ports. So if you've got a Thunderbolt display, that's pretty much the most common peripheral people are using right now. That's, that's great. There's a Thunderbolt Ethernet adapter because this does not have Ethernet built in. Uh, there are the Thunderbolt peripherals, but they're still pretty expensive because they haven't been hugely mass produced yet. They're not really wildly used, so there it is. But you can get things like hard drives and RAIDs if you look around, but they'll be expensive. So mostly for your display and your, your Ethernet when traveling. USB 3.0 port here, your combo headphone jack, that's the MagSafe 2 power connector on that side. Full-size SDXC card slot here, full-size HDMI, a relative new thing coming to Apple, we love that, and a second USB port. Now on our Samsung, this pretty much has micro everything because of their tapered sides here, except for things like the USB port. Standard barrel style charging connector, USB 3.0 port, 
we have HDMI here and then we have Ethernet via proprietary dongle adapter that does come in the box with ours it did uh, so you don't have to worry about buying that on this side we have another USB 3.0 port our combo audio jack and a proprietary VGA connector here so for those of you who have a hankering for a Thunderbolt display, particularly the, the MacBook Pro is going to be pretty darn attractive. Otherwise, for HDMI, you've got HDMI on both of these. And yes, HDMI works nicely on the latest generation 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display. We've tested that, and it looks just fine with monitors. I know there was some problem with some earlier models and kind of grainy-looking display output. Big difference in... In the internals here, this is an Ultrabook, just like the MacBook Air in some respects. It has a ULV CP CPU. These are both Haswell 4th generation CPUs, but this is the 15 watt CPU that you'll find in Ultrabooks. 1.6 gigahertz Core i5. Soon we should be seeing a Core i7 on the market. Uh, both of these start with 4 gigs of RAM and 128 gig SSD inside. The higher end model on this one will have 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig gig SSD to go with that Core i7, but anyway, ULV CPU, more than powerful enough for most people, but for those of you who do serious software development, developing large applications, I don't mean a small Android app, I mean like a pretty hefty desktop application, you've got IDE, IDE environments going, maybe some virtual machines, you might be more tempted by something like the MacBook Pro here because it has a full mobile CPU. That's a 28-watt CPU versus the 15-watt CPU here. Base clock speed on this for the 1299 model is 2.4 gigahertz versus the 1.6 gigahertz here, both of these being dual core and again has well. Now most people, if you're just doing Word, Excel, social networking, playing full HD videos, uh, playing some light games, casual games, that kind of thing, you're going to be fine with the ULV CPU. It's just for those people who are doing something more serious, like heavy-duty video editing again and software development. Those tasks that are very demanding are those of you who have those wildly long Excel spreadsheets. You've got 10,000 rows you need to calculate on. Then you'll notice a difference in the performance numbers. Both of these have webcams up top. I uh, give a little edge to Apple there for their larger pixels in their webcam. Now a little bit better, lighter video. And both of these have extremely high resolution displays. Now, Apple kind of started that trend with their retina displays in laptops, and the MacBook Pro has a 2560 by 1600 pixel display. Glossy display, uh, you can probably see a little glare as we move around, but you know, it's, they, they do try to control reflections with coating. Samsung also has a glossy display, and they decided to one up on Apple. They certainly are competing on every front with Apple. 3200 by 1800 pixel display, so even higher resolution. Now we're getting to the point where it's just a little bit psycho, but that's 275 ppi there. But the big difference in terms of usability is this has a touch screen. So, you know, you want to navigate the Windows UI, that's wonderful. Now, Mac OS doesn't even support touch screen, so it really doesn't matter too much to you if you just want to run Mac OS. But for those of you who actually kind of like Windows 8 or 8.1 that we've put on this and enjoy the touch experience, well, there's another significant difference. In terms of display technology, the Apple has an IPS display. Brightness we measured at 320 nits. That's pretty darn bright. Samsung uses a Super PLS display, which some people call a uh, RGBW pentile display. Now, it's not a pentile display like Samsung uses in their phones. That's quite different, actually. That's based on AMOLED technology. This is not AMOLED, so don't get too hung up on that. One thing that has been a topic of discussion lately is that when this is unplugged from power, the Samsung, the yellows look more golden or mustardy. It's because of the power saving, I think, that's running in the firmware for the display. When you plug it in, the yellows are absolutely yellow. So if that will bother you, if you're, if you're doing things, unplug your photo editor, for example, and you know you have to be unplugged, uh, that pushes you toward the Mac right there. In terms of text sharpness, both are excellent. Again, we're running Windows 8.1 here, so that has display scaling, and this is set to 200% set to display scaling. Icons are perfectly a readable size. Web page text is quite readable. I think I brought that down to 150% zoom. Let's just check that. No, we're at 200% right now. Readable, nice, ultra super sharp. And so you can see what text looks like on both of these. And you can see because we're, we're running white right now that 
a Mac is a little bit brighter. 280 nits of brightness on the Samsung, 320 nits we've measured. Contrast on both of these is high, about 800 to 1. Color accuracy on these, other than the white issue when it's unplugged, is excellent. Both of these cover nearly all of the sRGB color gamut and 75% of Adobe RGB. So in that way, for graphics professionals, both are quite suitable. Now, Windows 8.1 dis display scaling is certainly a, a, a great improvement. They, they've made the UI elements larger, like the closed box right here. That's easier to touch right now, that kind of thing. But third-party applications actually have to respect Windows scaling. For example, Adobe Photoshop does not. All the Adobe CS suite ignores it. So you're going to have super tiny little menus there as a result until they actually get with the program and start observing that. With the Mac, my complaint is the way they handle display scaling. Everything looks quite nice, particularly if you have RetinaWare apps. If you don't, then you're not going to get super sharp text. But they go with a display scaling that's equivalent to 1280 by 800 here, and that is just like too old-fashioned low resolution. I really don't know why they didn't go with the 1440 by 900 that they did on the MacBook Air, which has also a 13-inch display. And you can see how display scaling works right here. So you can choose scaled. Best for retina right there. So if we move up to something like, well, the 1440 by 900 equivalent are my favorite. You can go right here with 1680 by 1050. You get more usable real estate on your screen. I like that. And the text is still pretty readable. But if you think that this looks pretty tiny back here, you can dial it back down to the standard MacBook Air resolution. And I think that's much better because before it was sort of like, web page for the blind, way too big text. And I think Apple is just a little too overcautious in making everything a bit larger with scaling. Of course, that's obviously remedied. You will get the sharpest text when you go with the Apple mandated best for retina, however. It's still pretty sharp like this, though. It's, it's certainly one of the nicer displays on the market. Rounding out the specs, both of these have dual band Wi-Fi. Intel Wi-Fi here in the Samsung has had good range for us, 802.11bgn. The Mac has 802.11ac, which is backward compatible with N. So for those of you who are excited by AC networking and the faster intranet experience you might get, assuming that you have AC routers, there you go, you've got it. Both of these have Bluetooth 4.0 as well. Samsung includes their home sync light and for media server purposes, and also side sync. So those of you who have Galaxy phones, if you plug it in, you can do some nifty things, makes it easier to transfer media back and forth. You can even remotely control your phone using your laptop don't know why you'd want to, but you can. And with the Mac, I've always found that iTunes runs better under Mac OS than it does under Windows. So if you're heavy into the iTunes ecosystem, I find that it's more stable and it crashes less on the Mac. Lastly, there's battery life, and both of these are actually quite good. Now, Mac, Apple claims nine hours of actual use time with Wi-Fi on, and we said screen bright is typically to 50% when we test that. And Really, we are getting nine hours out of it, but the Samsung is no slouch either. It has a very large battery in this teeny casing as well. And typically, this is actually my personal unit, so I've used it quite a lot, and I've been averaging eight to eight and a half hours. So a little bit shorter on this, but not wildly different. So probably not going to be a factor, you know, half an hour out of all that much runtime between the two of these, since they're both pretty long. Both of them have compact chargers, and they charge fairly quickly. They're not one of those laptops that takes overnight to charge happily. You can charge it up to full, somewhere between two to four hours in either case. When it comes to gaming, neither of these has dedicated graphics. Uh, they both have Intel integrated graphics. You're getting faster Iris 5100 graphics, however, in our slightly beefier, more powerful Mac here. And here you have Intel HD 4400 graphics, which is typical for Ultrabooks. So, no, neither of these is a gaming machine per se. You can run Civ 5, I admit. I do it all the time. I, you can play Left 4 Dead 2. Battlefield 3, you know, you're going to have to go with really low settings and resolution though, for games like that. But the Mac, and in this case, assuming you're running native Windows, because a lot of these games are only available under Windows, does have more horsepower in terms of CPU, and the Iris 5100 graphics is a bit faster. So if you want to do some gaming on these and you really don't want to get a gaming rig, you're looking for something that comes the closest, at least lets you play stuff on low to medium settings and lower resolutions, the MacBook Pro 13-inch with Retina display would be actually the better pick. So that's the MacBook Pro versus the Samsung at T-Book 9 Plus. Uh, either way, you know you're getting a really lovely machine here. And first and foremost, as I said, depends on what operating system you want to run because you're going to have a much better experience with the Mac if you're running Mac OS X on it. Beyond that, you get more power in the Mac, you get a more svelte design and the ability to run Windows with a touchscreen feature on the Samsung.
I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review of both of these. Watch our video reviews of them and subscribe to our YouTube channel.